thank you. We thank you for today's grace. We thank you for today's mercy. We thank you that in this Advent season we are reminded that you came to dwell with us. And we are so grateful for your decision to come and dwell with us. And we need you now, God, to dwell with us in our time of study on today. Because you're never absent from us, we can be assured that you will always be with us. So Holy Spirit, we ask you now to center our minds and to clear the color from our thoughts and to reside in our hearts and to open our hearts to hear you speak to us today. That as we stand in this sacred moment, we recognize we need your divine grace. Bless us now, O God, according to your sovereign will and sovereign promise for our lives. And we promise we will give you all the glory we will give you all the honor, and we will give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Praise be unto God today. Amen. For those who want to be joining us virtually today, amen, we thank you for joining us today, amen, as we share in the word of the Lord in our Thursday Bible study. Praise God. All right, I want us to go right back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, where we spent some time last week. Um, and uh, I want us to take a look at primarily uh, that verse number 8, just the verse number 8, where it says three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. Now, um, Last week, we raised this idea of asking the question, why is this happening, God? Uh, the other night, on Tuesday night, I talked about it from the standpoint of when God says no, when God says no, because all of us will have to experience, if we have not yet already experienced, we will experience a no from God at least one time in our journey. Uh, and, and what, 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 strikes me in the storyline because when you read it, it talks about this grace that God says, that my grace is sufficient for you. And um, if we're not careful, we jump too fast to the distribution of grace that we miss a deeper struggle that resides in the storyline. Um, we recognize from the storyline that Paul right now has been declaring to us that he has this thorn in his flesh. Uh, one scholar, one translator says that literally means a thorn for his flesh. It, some people say he had malaria. Some say he had an eye disease. Some say he had a disfigured face. Um, some say he had this sexual burning that he could not contend with. Um, we don't really know what his weakness was. But Paul says this messenger from Satan was, had buffeted me to torment me. God, he was sent to me to keep me in a place of humility. So uh, we recognize that Paul is in a weak space. We recognize Paul is in a challenging space. And what uh, that leads us to is recognizing that in our own weakness, we can experience the grace, the strength, the power of God to help us deal with, navigate, survive, uh, live in uh, our moments of weakness. We can still accomplish what God would desire from us, that we experience, uh, as God said, that my, my power works best in weakness, that we can experience, if you will, the very best of God in our weakest of moments. Now, that, that, is the, that is the thrust and the theme of, of this particular chapter. But I, but I want us to focus our attention on the struggle that Paul had to contend with. And I don't believe it was so much the struggle in his flesh or for his flesh as it was having God not respond to his prayer. Okay, um, I want to give you uh, three verses of scripture. I want you to just write them down. 
um, if you can have them, uh, Matthew 21 and 22. Uh, Matthew 21 and 22 says these words. It says, um, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Those are Jesus' words, Matthew 21 and 22. And then Jesus lifts for us in Mark chapter 11 in verse 22, where Jesus utters these words, 24, rather, Mark 11, 24. He says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now, these are Jesus' words as it relates to the power of prayer. When you get to James, James chapter 5, James being the brother of Jesus, James says in uh, James chapter 5, verse number 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. For the fervent or the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. One translation says, The fervent, effectual prayers of the righteous availeth much. Here is where I want to wrestle today, if you don't mind. Uh, because I, sometimes the Bible, when you read the scriptures, sometimes the Bible will, will, will lead you and I into a place of internal contention. It will lead us to a place of spiritual tension that we have to wrestle with our own understanding of some things that hold deep theological significance to our lives. Nothing is more fundamental to the life of a believer than the issue of prayer. Amen. Nothing is more critical to the life of a believer than the issue of prayer. Jesus modeled what prayer is. He modeled the purpose of prayer. He modeled the power of prayer. He modeled the necessity of prayer for us by the time when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was in the wilderness and the devil was tempting him, even the utterance of the, the scriptures was his prayer language to the Lord, if you will. Uh, he modeled, he reminds us, he taught about when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites that was down the corners to be seen. So Jesus shows us and teaches us the, the, the reality of prayer in the life of the believer, in the life of a disciple. But the question comes in is when you find those moments in Scripture where prayer now becomes the object of tension. Okay. I gave you two verses Jesus said. Therefore, whatever you ask the Father, believe you shall receive. And then James comes behind and says, the fervent effectual prayers of the righteous avail as much. The text says, the text says in verse 8 of, of 2 Corinthians 12, three times I pleaded with the Lord. Three times I prayed to God that God would take this away from me. And God, each time, each time it said, my grace is sufficient for you. One translation says, each time he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And so the question then becomes, how do you handle it? How do you handle it when your prayer, when your prayer to God is not answered in the way that you believe and expect and hope for God to answer. Because that's what we see right here. Now we take that scripture and lay it up against Jesus' articulation. Lay it up against James, and there you find some contention. You find some, some tension in the scripture. And I want to suggest to us today that sometimes God will lead us intentionally to a place of internal tension, a place of internal unrest, a place of internal uh, of struggle with not what we believe, listen, but what he said. If I hold Jesus over here, Jesus is like, the, he, his word is bomb. Right? If I hold that over here and then I look at Paul's over here, my struggle is, well, 
God, but this is what you say. You say, whatever I ask you believing in, I will receive it. So here I see Paul asking you this with some level of belief that you will answer him, and you don't. So what does it say for you and me? Oh, no. First of all, it lets us know that prayer is not an automatic reversal switch. Prayer cannot be used as a manipulative tool to get God to do what we want God to do. Listen, especially when what we want God to do is not the will of God for us in the moment. That we cannot use it just arbitrarily for God to convenience us when God's purpose might be to inconvenience us. So when I look at Paul's story, Paul, God intentionally put Paul in a place of inconvenience. Paul, God needed for Paul to be in the place Paul was in because Paul said to keep me from boasting, to keep me from becoming more self-reliant, to keep me from being more self-dependent, to keep me in a place of humility. So if that was the reason God allowed the uh, the, 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 the buffer, the buffering attack of Satan to come to Paul's life, then it explains why God would not answer Paul because Paul wanted it in the moment probably to be a manipulative tool to make his life more convenient. When God didn't want him to thrive or live in a place of convenience, God wanted him to be in a place of dependence. God help us today. So, when I look at this thing, the first thing that jumps out to me is that sometimes God does not answer the prayers we want God to answer in the way we want God to answer. It's because sometimes we can be using the prayer as a way to manipulate God to accommodate us when, the, when accommodating us is not God's desire for us in the moment. It does not mean we don't pray. It simply means I have to now assess and properly interpret why the prayer may not have been answered in the manner that I want the prayer to be answered. Because at the end of the day, ultimately, it comes down to, as Jesus said, uh, not my will, hmm, but thy will be done. He said, if you want to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the only way for the will of God in heaven to be done on earth is it has to be done through the people of God. Now we can see that from a favorable standpoint when God works in our behalf to make our ways clear or to fight our battles or to meet our needs. But we don't always see that as clearly when, God, when God's will is being done in us but what we want God to do is not the same as what God is trying to get done. Lord, help us today. Three times, he said, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So, first of all, first of all, that we cannot use prayer as a tool to manipulate God, to convenience us, when convenience may not be God's intention for us at the moment. Not only that, we have to understand and be clear about something. That when God says no or God doesn't respond in the manner, forget the fact that God said no. The idea that God doesn't respond in the manner that we want God to respond. Because sometimes it's not necessarily a no. It can be uh, not that way. It can be not in this fashion. It, it can come, but it may not come the way you want it to come. Right? So, not only that, we have to understand that prayer is still subject to God's ultimate purpose. That whatever the will of God is, the Bible says something along these lines that we, 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 some, we pray and we don't receive because sometimes we're asking what is against the will of God for our lives. That our prayers sometimes are not in line with the will of God for our lives in the moment. That even our prayers are always going to be subject to the purpose of God for
for us in the moment. And you see it right there, that God's purpose was not for Paul to find a way to be convenient. It was to help him understand that even in your weakness, I am still able to provide for you. Even in your weakness, that's when you experience the best of me. In your weakness is where I need you to be because you won't experience me in the way I need you to experience me if you don't go down that valley experience right there. Does that make sense to you? So, so Paul, Paul in the moment, his prayer was subject to the purpose of God. Now, I know there are people who told you right now that you can say, you can put a demand on God's word. You can tell God what God's word says, and God has to honor God's word. That says to me that I am the one who can now dictate to God what God is going to do. And forget the fact that God's purpose still overrides. God's purpose still has authority over my prayer. That my prayer is still subject to what God desires to have done in my life. Amen and amen. Now see, you, you, uh, uh, this kind of conversation, this kind of language, this kind of talking is not fundamental for a whole lot of believers. Because we like to believe that God is our genie in a box. That we can call God and rub his belly three times and tell him what we want, and God can do it. <laughs> or he's like, uh, that TV show, Be Witch, he's going to put his nose and he, it's going to happen. No, it don't happen like that. That all of creation is subject to the creator. So even, even my, 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 my creaturely prayer is subject to the one who made me. So Paul is saying, or learning, or teaching us today, that I can pray all day long, but I still have to come to a place in my experience where I realize that even my prayer is going to be subject to the purpose of God in my life. That if God has intended for me to experience something that's going to be a crucial for my development, no matter how much I pray not to have to deal with it, that prayer is still subject to the overall purpose that God has for my life. Hallelujah. Have you ever heard anybody say this? Uh, 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 okay, I'll give you the, the verse first. Jesus says, Seek, you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. Ask, and it shall be given. And the idea there is, is this repetitiveness and petitioning God. The repetitiveness, okay. And Jesus says, if you keep pushing, you keep pushing, you keep pushing, you'll get an answer. You keep pushing, you keep pushing, you'll get an answer. But, but what it does not say, it does not say what kind of answer you're going to get. Amen. If he says, seek, you'll find. Ask, it'll be given. Knock, and the door shall be open. But he does, he does not tell you what you're going to find. He does not tell you what's going to be behind the door. He doesn't even tell you what's going to be given to you. He just says, you continue to do what you do and trust God for the rest. Okay. Some people tell you that you don't have to ask God the same thing over again because God heard it the first time. Some people say that if you ask God the same thing over and over again, it just means you don't have faith in God. Because if you had faith in God, you just ask it one time. Now, to me, that's contradictory to the Bible. Because again, on one hand, Jesus says, ask, give it. Seek, find, knock, door open. It's the idea of repetitiveness. And then I look at Paul right here. And Paul says three times, which, which to me says that there is this constant petitioning of God for the same thing. <clears throat> for the same thing. Now what I want to, 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 to walk away from and get no know right there is that the repetitiveness of our prayer does not guarantee the resolution to your problem. Okay. 
if a child, we got, we got kids, grandkids, they come and ask you the same thing over and over and over again. Can I have? Mama, can I have? Grandma, can I have? Daddy, can I have? Brenda, can I have? And you said no every time. You said no every time. And it's not because you don't love them. Sometimes it's because you know that what they're asking you for <laughs> is not something they need in the moment. They're asking because they believe that if I get on your nerves enough, you will give in to me. They're asking, believe, or asking, not even quite understanding yet that you're asking me over and over again is not going to make me move and do what you want me to do. That, that, that has to be something that I feel, number one, is best for you in the current moment. And two, am I, am I able to provide that for you in the moment? So Paul's repetitious, repetition of asking God, we have to take a step back now and say, well, if I keep asking, it does not necessarily mean that's going to change the outcome to my situation. That's not a bad thing. Because again, it keeps me in a place of dependence. It keeps me in a place of, of, of this connection to God where I need to be. Because I don't know when God might just honor my request. It doesn't, and see, the idea there is, is if, if I don't continue petitioning God, then I become hard to God. I become distant from God. Because you know and I know that when people keep asking somebody something and they don't do it all the while, they stop dealing with it. Hallelujah. They, they stop messing with stuff, fooling with them. They say stuff like, I ain't fooling with them, but the last six times I asked them something, they ain't gonna help me. So I ain't got time for them. I, I'll go find somebody who can help me. But Paul asked God three times, Lord, take, take this away from me. And every time he asked God, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. He asked again, same answer. Ask again, same answer. Because there are moments in our lives we have to understand that no matter how many times we ask God the same prayer, it does not guarantee that God is going to resolve our problem. Because sometimes, sometimes, the issue is not resolution, but the issue is revelation. Oh my God. It, it is not resolution, it is revelation. <laughs> it, it is coming to a place of understanding that even if God does not fix this thing, okay, what are the Hebrew boys at? Before they went into the furnace, they told the king that God that we serve is able to deliver us. And then they turn right around and say, but even if he does not deliver us, it is not because he cannot it's because he just chose not to. And in the moment of their situation, they didn't get resolution, they got a revelation. And in the revelation, God gave them some resolution. Amen. 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 And so sometimes God wants for us to get the revelation first. Yeah. Because getting you out of it, would be, answering your prayer would be too easy. Yeah. Because then you won't come to understand what I need you to understand. Yeah. And sometimes you gotta go in it and be in it for a while, and then you discover, oh Lord, I'm still standing. Oh Lord, I'm still surviving. Oh Lord, I'm still making it. Oh Lord, you're still making the way out of the way. Ain't that changed yet, but you have shown me that my prayer, listen, has not changed my situation, but my, the, my prayers have changed my perspective on my situation. And that's the ultimate revelation sometimes we need to get to. Because what God gave Paul was a revelation that would change how Paul viewed his perspective. Because then he starts talking stuff about, I ain't gonna boast in my successes, but I'm gonna boast in all of my weaknesses, because that's when I'm weak. That's when I realize 
I am strong. But I'm at my lowest point. That's when I realize just what God is able to do in my life. But if I had gotten out of it, I never would have known what God is really able to do. And sometimes we are praying and we're praying the wrong thing. And we get upset that God ain't working the way we want God to work. Not realizing God says, you need a revelation first and then you'll come to find your resolution. Hallelujah. Because it's right here in the storyline. He says, okay, therefore, I'm going to boast more gladly about my weaknesses. That's the revelation I got. God didn't do this thing for me. He didn't take it away from me. He didn't take it away from me. But I learned something. And you know what? Sometimes we learn something, or we, let me rephrase it. Sometimes we learn more about ourselves than we do about God in situations that God does not fix in our lives. Amen. Sometimes we come to a place of discovering just how much we can really handle. Sometimes we come to a place of discovering just how strong I really am by the grace of God. Sometimes we discover that I am not as far away or far off or bad off as I thought I was. Sometimes it is not as threatening to me as I once believed it was. Right. Amen. And so the reality there is, is that Paul's prayer, even though his prayers did not change his condition, his prayers ultimately changed his perspective on what he was contending with. And I want to suggest today that we should sometimes not pray for God to change our situation but pray so that God might change our perspective of our situation. Amen. Amen. Or ask God to let my prayer work in a way where I get to see the reality of what you're doing in me over and against what I want you to do for me. Oh. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's not that. Yeah. Paul wanted God to get him out. God said, I need you to stay right there. <laughs> Paul said, God, I want you to take it from me. God said, I need you to carry it a little while longer. Ah, oh, God, oh, God. Hey. Paul said, God, I want you, I need you to resolve this problem. God said, I want you to carry the problem. Or vice versa. God, I want you to resolve God said, I need you to carry it. Because what Paul wanted was not what God needed. And what Paul thought he needed may not have been what God wanted. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he prays three times. So, so we take away from that today, number one, first of all, that prayer is not an automatic reversal switch. It's not, it cannot be used as a tool to manipulate God. Prayer is still going to be subject to the purpose of God over our lives. No matter what we pray and how we pray, we cannot use our prayers to cause God to override what his purpose is for us in the moment. There will be times when we have to deal with the reality that God has something up his sleeve that God wants to accomplish. Because I can bet you, I can bet you a dime to a dollar if I were a bet man, that when God told the prophet, I'm going to send them to Babylon for 70 years, I guarantee you, somebody who heard that started praying, Lord, don't let us go back down now. Lord, keep us out of that. Lord, we don't want to go back. Lord, we're sorry, Lord. We repent the Lord. Please, Lord, please, do it any other way but that. And he said, you're going back for 70 years. And I can guarantee you that during that 70 year period, somebody prayed, Lord, get me out of here. Lord, take him away from us. Lord, resolve our problem. But God said, at the appointed time, I will come back to get you. Which tells me that there's always going to be an appointed time for God to arrive and do what God has designed to do. When his purpose for our lives have been complete, then he'll step in and usher us into a whole new place and a whole new direction. Hallelujah. Repentance of our prayers does not guarantee resolution to our problems. And if prayer is critical, 
in the relationship we have with God. Listen, prayer is more important in our relationship with God as opposed to how God changes our circumstances. Prayer is what keeps us connected to the source of our hope. We don't pray as people who have no hope. Because the reason we pray is because hope is pushing our prayer. We pray because we believe that God will somehow, some way, sometime make a way for us. We pray because we believe that we have a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask, think, or imagine. We pray because we have a God who we believe will not leave us nor forsake us. We pray because we have a God who we believe that his ears are always open to the cries of the people. And so our prayers is more critical to our relationship over and against God working things out the way we want God to work them out. Amen. Because at some point in the journey, God can do, and God can do, and God can do. Okay, let me let me let me come at another angle. When you have one of the dangers in when you raise kids is that when you give them what they want all the time they begin to take you for granted. As if you're supposed to do this for me when I ask. So their asking is not from the standpoint that they want to keep the relationship thriving. They're asking from the standpoint because they want you to meet their or accommodate their desire. They're asking from the standpoint of what the outcome is going to be, as opposed to asking because they just want to be in relationship with you. So we ask God so all over and over again, just because we want the outcome to be the way we want it, we're not praying from the standpoint that the relationship means something to us. We are praying because your provision means more to us than the relationship. God, help us today. And that's dangerous. So what I took from Paul, what the Holy Spirit allowed me to see in Paul's experience, was that no matter how much he prayed, he was in a season of his life where God was going to accomplish God's objective for his life. And it didn't matter how many times he asked God not to do it. Now see, that, what it says to us, it says to us on a deeper level, at some point in time, we have to grow up and accept the fact that God is still God. We have to grow up and realize that God is the one who is navigating the ship of my life. God is the one who is leading me where God desires for me to be. God is the one who's more concerned about my spiritual development than God is about my physical convenience. Hallelujah. Remember the story, I'm going to close with this story. Remember the story when, 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 when God told Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. A three days journey they might come worship me. They might come worship me. God did plague after plague after plague after plague after plague after plague after plague. Pharaoh finally relented when he couldn't take anymore. They've been praying for 400 years. God did us out. God did us out. God did us out. God did us out. When God finally got around, brought him out. The text says something along these lines. He said, it says, God did not lead them the easy way, but he led them the long way. And he said, because if they see the sight of danger, they're going to want to go back to where they came from. Sometimes, 
See, our problem is, and what commercialized faith has done, is commercialized faith has made faith the biggest thing where it happens quickly. You can get it quickly from God. All you have to do is name and claim it. All you have to do is tag it and grab it. That's it. God will do the rest. And we have people growing up in churches today, in faith today, who, who cannot wait a week for a prayer to be thought about being answered. Because everything has to happen quickly. There's a reason why God did not take them the quick way. Teach, brother. Because God is trying to tell us that your experience with me is always going to be a long journey of discovery. It's not going to be a short, quick trip. It's going to take you some time to walk with me, to discover, listen, to discover what I need to discover, to discover about me. God does not need to know us. God is not walking on this journey so God can discover who we are. He's taking us the way he takes us so that we can discover who God is. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we honor you. We thank you, God. That a walk with you, Lord, is not always an easy trip around the block. Sometimes it's a long walk through the wilderness. Sometimes it's a long walk through enemy territory. Sometimes it's a long walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes it's a long walk through having our prayers unanswered. Sometimes, God, it's a, night, it's a long night of wrestling with you. You're teaching us, oh Lord, that this relationship we have with you is not some instantaneous, over the night, quick thing. It is something that takes time. Help us, O oh Lord, to be patient with ourselves. Help us, O oh God, to rest in a deeper place of peace and trust, knowing that you know what's best for us. And in those moments, O oh God, where we're struggling, we're wrestling, and we're tossed to and fro, we don't quite understand why you're doing this or why you're not doing that or why you're allowing this and why you didn't do this. Help us to gain a deeper revelation that might lead us to greater clarity and perspective of who you are and what you're capable of doing in our lives. And then ultimately, prayerfully, we'll lead or be led to that place of resolution. Let us not take the lack of resolution as your disregard for our lives, but let us take the lack of resolution as the prerequisite for a greater revelation. Bless us today, O oh God, as we journey forward with you, realizing it's a long walk it's a long walk. Just as Enoch walked with God, help us now, Lord, to walk with you. And we promise to give you the glory, the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen.